Good morning. Uh, it's really good to see you all today. I want to ask you a question, as I uh, often like to do right off the bat today. I just want to ask you, has something like this ever happened to you? So maybe you walk into uh, a room and you see a group of your friends and they're having a conversation some distance away. And so you walk over to them and because you're a humble person, you know, you wait to, to jump in and you just kind of listen in to the conversation that they're, that they're having. They're, you just try to listen in and figure out what it is that they're talking about. And then after uh, you know, a few moments pass, you think to yourself, these people must be absolutely, completely insane. What are these people talking about? I have no idea. What seems so normal and natural to them seems so off the wall that you start to wonder if you should even be friends with these people at all in the first place, that they must be clinically Insane. Uh, or maybe here's another example. You come home and your roommates, maybe your family members, uh, are watching a movie. And so once again, you say, okay, let me figure out what's going on here. Let me watch this movie with them. And so you watch it for a few minutes, five or ten minutes, and once again, you come to the conclusion, this has to be the dumbest movie that is ever made, that Hollywood has ever produced. You have so many questions and you have no idea what's going on. Why is this dog talking? Why is this dog playing basketball and everyone just seems comfortable and okay with this? Is, th is that not against a rule of some sort? Uh, why are the parents the size of ants? It seems like the most nonsense movie that you've ever seen in your life. And so now let me press in and ask you, what is it in both of those situations that you were missing? What was the key ingredient that you were missing in both of those examples? And I'll give you the answer that what you were missing was context. That what you were lacking in those situations is that you did not have the context for what was going on in that situation. Uh, so to define the word context, it is the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea in terms which it can be fully understood. So basically the circumstances that create the setting so that we can actually understand what is going on. This is what context means. And when we have a lack of it, it can lead to some very serious confusion. And so we're going to put a picture up on the screen behind me to give us one more example of, of what this looks like. So I'm just going to give you a moment to kind of let this sink in. And let's, let's break this down, right? Let, let's analyze what's, what's taking place in this picture. So this young lady is lying, maybe it looks like in the middle of the road, fairly unresponsive, unable to get up. And she says, please call me an ambulance. And so the error that took place in this situation is that the gentleman failed to take in the context of the situation. He, he didn't pick up on the context clues that she's lying on the ground, that she's asking for help, and so he calls her an ambulance, uh, but not in the right way that she intended, right? He failed to interpret what she was actually saying. So context is essential for us to correctly understand what's going on. And without even realizing it, we really rely very heavily on context every single day. Context really surrounds pretty much everything that we do. Every conversation that we have, every book that we read, every movie that we watch, context is so essential for us to be in the know, be informed, to understand what is taking place. And so this is kind of my thesis for today, is if context is this important in our everyday life, try to imagine for a moment how vital context must be for us when we read the Bible. When we read God's Word, if context is this important in our life, just imagine how important it is for us to have context when we read God's Word, the Bible. Because without proper context, the Bible has been and it absolutely can be misunder in, misunderstood or twisted in some very, very serious, dramatic ways. I want to take us to a verse, it's 2 Peter 3.16, and the Apostle Peter is writing here, uh, and I put in parentheses Paul there because in the previous verses, Peter makes it clear that he's referring to the Apostle Paul, who wrote m most of, the majority of, the New Testament. And so this is what Peter is writing about the Apostle Paul. He says this, he, Paul, writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. And so, you know, I want us to pause here for a moment and just kind of let that sink in what it is that we just read there. To take a moment, uh, and again, let it sink in that this is the Apostle Peter 
Jesus' right-hand man who spent three years right beside the Messiah learning from him directly. Peter, who is a contemporary, who knew Paul personally, interacted with him, had conversations with him, uh, who lived in the same culture, lived in the same time period as Paul, and even with all of that going for him, he still says here, Peter still says here, that Paul can be confusing, that Paul can be hard to understand. And so when we, uh, in light of that, I think it should encourage us to have both humility and grace when it comes to our reading of Scripture. On the one hand, we need to have the humility to really think carefully before we too quickly come to our scriptural conclusions. That just at a quick glance, oh yeah, I got it, that makes sense to me, I can fully understand that and just come to these quick conclusions. But on the flip side, we also need to show ourselves grace. That if, if Paul was hard for Peter to understand, that certainly some of what's in Scripture is going to be hard and difficult for us to understand as well. And so with all that established, my goal for us this morning is I want to talk through four layers of context. I'm going to give us four bullet points up on the screen. These are four layers of context that we all need to know, be mindful of, and really see these as lenses through which we look at Scripture to make sure that we correctly interpret uh, what we read in God's Word, the Bible. We are delving into a topic called hermeneutics. Okay, so that's the big word that you can store today and impress your friends with. We're delving into hermeneutics, which is the discipline of seeking to accurately interpret the Bible. And a really core verse on this topic of hermeneutics is 2 Timothy 2.15. Uh, and now here, it is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy when he writes this. He says, Do your best <clears throat> to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So just two quick takeaways from this passage here. First uh, is for us to see that if it's possible to correctly handle the word of truth, if it's possible to correctly handle the Bible, then that implies that it's also very possible for us to incorrectly handle God's word. You know, other translations say uh, to be able to rightly divide God's word. And so if there's a right way to divide God's word, that means that it's possible that we can also uh, do it in the wrong way. And then the second thing I want us to see is that do your best, that opening phrase of that verse it's translated in other translations to make every effort to study or to be diligent. And so the idea here is that proper interpretation is something that we can grow in and it is something that we should work on. Uh, that we, this is something that we can get better at to become more and more confident and skilled at. So before we start to dive into these layers of context, I want to give uh, a fair amount of disclaimers or caveats this morning just for a moment. Uh, and, and the first one is this, is that we really cannot go extraordinarily deep into any of these topics that we're going to talk about today. Uh, my wife, Ashley, and I, a few years ago, we went through a seminary program, 15 courses that we completed, took us about two years to do so. And uh, at least two of the courses that we took were completely focused on these topics that we're going to talk about today. So there's six credit hours. But the majority of the other courses that we took at least touched on these topics. And so today, we're going to do little more than scratch the surface. But what I want to do is I do hope to slightly open your eyes today, maybe to one or two new concepts that you haven't thought about before, of a lens that you need to have to correctly interpret Scripture. And I really want to whet your appetite to make you say, I want to learn more about that. I want to grow in uh, my knowledge of that. The other caveat that I will say is that today's message might feel a little bit different than a normal sermon that you hear. Today's message is probably going to feel a little bit more educational and informational than it does inspirational. But I still believe that it can absolutely be transformational. Uh, and I know that that was a lot of words that kind of rhymed. Um, so uh, here's what I encourage. I encourage us today to be deep thinkers. I encourage us to put on our thinking caps to really engage mentally with this subject matter. God's word is a gift. Probably right beside Jesus, it is perhaps one of the greatest gifts that God has given us, that the invisible, unseen God that created this universe gave us this written record of who he is, of how he acts, his characteristics, and his character. And so it is a gift. Uh, and therefore, because it is such an incredible gift, we should grow in our ability to get out of it all that we can, as much that we can. 
So with those disclaimers out of the way, let me give you four layers of context that we need to have to rightly understand the Bible. And the first layer that we're going to talk about today is called the cohesive context. Now, most of these phrases, uh, you know, others could subdivide these contexts into 10 or 12 or 20 different kind of layers. Some of these I've combined together a few different concepts, but this first one I want to talk about is the cohesive context. Uh, my daughter, Olive, she loves doing puzzles. Down in our basement, we have this entire table that's basically set aside as the puzzle table, and we have like 10 or 12 different puzzles on that table. And she really enjoys it, and I'm not going to lie, I kind of do too. You know, we sit down, and I feel really accomplished when there's this, you know, 10-piece puzzle, and I knock it out in 30 <laughs> seconds, and it's like, I am a genius. I am absolutely brilliant. But I think that the reason that she has fun with it is because there's just something intrinsically satisfying about taking a fragmented piece, a piece that's kind of disconnected, and then playing detective and doing the investigative work to find where does these, this piece fit into the larger puzzle, right? What is the role that this piece is meant to play? There's something satisfying about that. But yet very often when people approach Scripture, we actually can do the very opposite of this. So rather than trying to find the place where the piece fits in the puzzle, sometimes we can tend to just rip the piece right out of the puzzle altogether. There is a quote uh, from the author, theologian, D.A. Carson. And the quote uh, goes like this, that a text without context is a pretext for a proof text. And uh, what, what does that mean? So, so let's break that down a little bit. A text, he's referring to a verse or a passage in Scripture without context, which is what we're talking about today, is a pretext, which means it's kind of a setup for or there's the possibility for a proof text. And so now what, what does he mean by a proof text? Well, a proof text is when, some, is when someone selectively chooses and then uses isolated Bible verses to make a point or to defend their position, whether or not those verses had anything to do with the actual topic that they're trying to relate it to, right? That's what a proof text is, is taking a, a, a verse out of context and applying it to defend a particular position, so here is a really overly simplified example of, of a proof text. Here's an example of what this looks like. So did you know that the Bible actually says that there is no God? You know, did you know that? And, and your first instinct might be, no, no way, the Bible doesn't say that. Oh, okay, well, I can prove it. Because Psalm 14, verse 1, we're going to put it up on the screen. There it is. There is no God. And, and I promise you, I'm actually not misquoting Scripture there. That, that, if you turn to Psalm 14, 1, it says there is no God. Right? So therefore, the Bible's contradictory, case closed, end of story, let's all head home. You know, it's, it's all a sham, right? Uh, but let's look at the full verse. Let's pull back and get a little bit more context. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good, right? And so this was a super simple, easy example uh, to see, you know, that this was very quickly unraveled by just reading the full verse, However, <clears throat> there are some very well-known verses that can be a bit less or a much less obvious for us to correctly interpret. Uh, a very popular verse is Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13, and you probably don't need me to even quote it, but in the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, uh, it reads, I can do all things through him, speaking of Jesus, who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This verse, uh, social media influencers, they put it in their bio. Football players, they put it on the tape underneath their eyes. And it's this kind of inspiring verse. And at a face value reading, it sounds like it's communicating one thing. It sounds like it's saying, anything that I choose, anything that I set my mind to, God can help me do it. I can accomplish anything that I just want to go after because God will help me do it. However, with, you know, by simply reading just the few verses that lead up to this verse, it very quickly transforms the actual message. And we can more, uh, very quickly realize what the Apostle Paul was actually communicating, which was really a very different message. He was saying, I've learned how to survive. I've learned how to get through. I've learned how to endure suffering, hardship, persecution. As long as I rely on Christ, then I can get, get through. I can endure these very difficult things. That's really what he's saying. And so, I think that some of our mistakes here come from the way that we view the Bible, right? The way that we view the Bible is really going to dramatically affect the way that we read it. And I think that for many of us, or many Americans, we can approach the Bible as if it is a cookbook, as if it is a cookbook, and I'll explain what I mean by that. 
In our fast-paced culture, we would love to have a resource that we can look to for immediate answers. I've got a problem, and I need to turn to the instruction manual to find the solution, and I need it right now. I need it quick. Like a cookbook, we would like to be able to open to the glossary, find something that seems desirable for us. Oh, I could go for some cake today. Or, you know, for us, oh, I could go for some joy today. I could go for some patience today. So let me simply turn to that chapter and read the 10-step instructions, and then I can produce that result in my life. But unfortunately, the Bible is not a cookbook. It is more than just an instruction manual, and it is more than just a theological grab bag that we can just reach into to get a moral statement that we can apply to our life on that particular day. And so what is it that I'm practically proposing when it comes to the cohesive context? Uh, This is what I'm proposing. For any book of the Bible that we read, we need to be conscious of the cohesive flow of thought that runs from the beginning of that book to the end of that book. Like overlapping circles, we need to consider how each phrase properly fits into its sentence, how each sentence fits into its paragraph, how each paragraph fits into its passage, and how each each passage fits into the cohesive, unified message of that particular book. The biblical authors, they did not simply record random events and disconnected spiritual concepts, but rather they sought to communicate cohesive messages about who God is and how we can relate to him. Uh, Additionally, most books that we read, they will have one or a few central unifying themes. And if we understand what that theme is, it can help bring meaning and context to each of the passages that we read. When we zoom out and pull back from any particular verse that is confusing or misleading to us, it will massively help us make sense of how that particular puzzle piece is meant to fit into the bigger picture of what God is communicating through the biblical authors. And so that is the first layer of context, cohesive context. The second layer that I'd like us to look at today is what I would call circumstantial context. Circumstantial context. In 2016, I had the privilege of living in San Jose, Costa Rica uh, with a missionary family for two months. It was a really special time in my life, really pivotal season uh, that I'm very, very thankful that God allowed me to have. I entered into a country, Costa Rica, that obviously had a completely different language, but as I came to discover, also had a very, very different culture. Not only was the language different, but the culture was incredibly different to our culture here in America. And I'll briefly give you three examples of what I encountered as some major cultural differences. One is the way that people drive. Uh, The way that people drive there in in Costa Rica and especially San Jose. Uh, In Costa Rica, traffic lines, road signs, and speed limits, they're all more suggestive than mandatory, right? They're kind of just, you know, hey, this is a good idea. This is what we'd recommend. (laughs) But kind of, you know... Do, do what you want. Um, and so if you drove here in America, how, you, how they drive there, you would probably get pulled over and arrested. I can, I can pretty much guarantee you that. You know, very close, very fast, you know, again, very loose with the rules is the way that they drove. And if you drove there the way that we drive here, you would be certain to get honks, hand signals, and you might even learn some new Spanish words as the drivers are encouraging you to drive mas rapido. <laughs> Por favor. Uh, Number two, the second cultural difference that I uh, experienced was how you greet people in Costa Rica. And so my missionary host, he kind of sat me down uh, one of the first weeks that I was there, and he said, all right, Caleb, uh, here's what you need to know on how to greet people. He said, if you're greeting a man, you know, if we're going to church or to youth group, pretty pretty standard. You can handshake, dap them up, whatever whatever you want to do. But he said, if you're going to greet a woman or a young lady here in Costa Rica, the custom is that here's what you do you gently place your right cheek next to her right cheek. And then the part that was really different for me is you're supposed to make a light kiss sound, like a little smooch sound, okay? So very awkward, very very uncomfortable for me as a young man in my early 20s, and this was a big adjustment. Did not feel normal at at first, but but over time, you become a little bit more comfortable with it. Uh, And then here's the third example that I can give you of a cultural difference uh, is uh, on the... It was my last day there, and very sweet of them, they threw me kind of a party, a farewell party, because I was flying back maybe the the next day. 
And so this party had food and had drinks, and they even made a cake for me, which I thought was incredibly kind of them. And so here, here's the cake. And, and they said, here, why don't you, you know, sit here and pose next to Ho Sway? And I said, okay, that's so, you know, so sweet of them. They just want me to pose here next to Ho Sway. But then I learned very quickly that this is their cultural custom there, which is that they like to shove your face into the cake. And, <laughs> and so this is, uh, you know, a sign of great affection, I think. I hope so. And so once again, key differences that don't necessarily translate between cultures. I would not recommend at your next birthday party that you shove uh, whoever's face it is into the cake. You might not get invited back to the next birthday party. So here's the point that I'm making in all of that. When I went to Costa Rica, it would have been very ignorant for me to go into that culture and expect that culture to cater to my norms and the things that I was used to. But rather, because I recognized that I was the one entering into their culture, I knew that it was my responsibility to adjust what was normal for me and really adapt to the culture that I was entering into. And so when it comes to Scripture, here's what I want to say bluntly. We cannot be ignorant Americans. We cannot be ignorant Americans when it comes to our reading of Scripture. Today, we are living in Hagerstown, Maryland, in the year of our Lord, 2024. Uh, We have smartphones in our pockets, we drive cars, and we live in air-conditioned homes. And so we need to remember the fact that the world that we are living in today is dramatically, almost completely different to the world of the biblical authors and the audiences that they wrote to. And so we really need to be aware of this. And so in light of this, there should always be a two-step process involved in our interpretation of Scripture, a two-step process. And in the first step, we should seek to understand what the original author was intending to communicate to his original audience within the original context. So let me say that again. We need to seek to understand what the original author was seeking to communicate to their original audience within their original context. That is the first step. And so to understand this, we should research uh, a number of circumstantial factors, and I'll give us three in particular Uh, quickly here. The first is historical setting, the second is cultural factors, and the third is the occasion of the writing. For historical setting, we should know when the book was written, what the geopolitical factors were at the time, and what key historical events led up to the moment of the writing. For cultural factors, we need to have a basic understanding of the religious practices, worldview perspectives, social structures, values, and customs of the people groups involved. And then thirdly, for the occasion of the writing, we need to know who the author was, who their audience was, what their relationship was like, and why the book was written, right? What was the situation or the circumstances that prompted this author to write this particular letter or this particular book of the Bible? In order to properly understand the Bible today, we must first journey back to the ancient world and seek to hear Scripture through the ears of the original readers of Scripture, Once we've done that, we are then prepared for the second step of essentially uh, carrying that message of Scripture back to our world today and looking to apply it to our life. Here, we look for what would be an obedient response that is appropriate to our modern-day context, yet is still corresponds to the purpose of the original text. So that is the circumstantial context. I'm going to take us to number three, which is the literary context. Literary context. Uh, In a sense, the Bible is one book, right? If you order it online or you pick it up from a bookstore, you're going to buy one book called the Holy Bible. Yet, in another sense, it is more precisely an anthology, or you could even say a library of books. The Bible is a collection of 66 unique books written in three different languages by 40 different authors over the course of 1,500 years. And all of that really contributes to an incredible amount of diversity that exists within, uh, within the Bible. Adding to that diversity is the fact that these biblical authors, these 40 different authors, they used a wide repertoire of literary styles in their writing. They didn't just write with, with one style or one genre. And so if you were to walk into a bookstore today, which is becoming harder and harder to find thanks to Amazon, but if you did find a bookstore, you would see signs marking different sections of the bookstore. And each of those sections would contain distinct, very different styles of literature in each of those sections. You might see history, biography, poetry, science fiction, romance, comic books, and plenty more. 
And recognizing these different categories is really important because it will shape the expectations that you bring to the table when you read that particular piece of literature, right? We would never read a comic book as if it is a newspaper. And if we, if we did, it would seem as if the world was in some very serious trouble. And so in the same way, to con- correctly interpret a passage of Scripture, we have to know what literary genre it falls under because there are unique characteristics to each of these genres. So at the highest level, the three broadest umbrellas of literary styles in the Bible are historical narrative, uh, which makes up about 43% of the Bible. The next is poetry, which makes up one-third, 33% of the Bible. And then the third, again, these are the broadest categories, uh, is called prose discourse, which makes up 24% of the Bible. And uh, let me break these down and explain very briefly what these different literary styles are. Historical narrative. It is essentially stories of real historical events involving characters in a setting with a plot. It's people in a place, and there's an unfolding drama. This is the primary genre of the Bible, and I believe that that is because our God is a storytelling God. Universally, stories, uh, it's the most universal form of communication that exists. It allows us to kind of put ourselves into the narrative and to imagine what would we have done in those situations. A key principle to remember when we are reading narrative is that it is most often descriptive and we should not assume that it is prescriptive. We can get into some incredible trouble if we assume that just because it happened in the Bible that therefore we should do it. There's all sorts of instances where what people did was disobedient. And so what we need to look at is through the lens of were the actions of the characters obedient to what God instructed and how did he respond to their actions? Did God bless their actions? So that is historical narrative. The second is poetry, which uses dense creative language linking together images to help us envision the world differently. Poems use symbolic language and metaphor to evoke our emotions and imagination. It's really crucial when we evaluate poetry to make sure that we understand what is meant to be communicated literally versus figuratively. Essentially, what is the literal object and what is the figurative object? One example very quickly is my God is my rock. God is my rock. And so in that situation, God is the literal object that's being metaphorically uh, related to a rock. And so then we can think about What are the characteristics of a rock? It's solid. It doesn't move. It doesn't change. We can stand on it. And in that way, it helps us to think about God in a new dimension and in a new way that is still true. Number three, uh, prose discourse. It involves speeches, letters, or essays. The focus here is building a sequence of ideas or thoughts into a linear argument that requires a logical response. The majority of New Testament letters, they fall under this category as the biblical authors are basically making a case, building an argument for how we should live in light of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So uh, these are the broad categories, but then beneath them there are several more specific genres, including the Gospels, Biblical Law, Parables, Wisdom Literature, Prophecy, Apocalyptic, and Epistles. Uh, Most books of the Bible have a primary style, but many of them have multiple And so we have to be careful to know when uh, a book kind of um, transitions between these different literary styles to know uh, what's being communicated. Knowing these unique traits and nuances of these genres will help us to better grasp the messages that they are conveying. And this brings us now to the final layer of context that I'd like, like us to look at, which is the redemptive context. The redemptive context. So far today, we have talked about several aspects that make the Bible a very diverse book, right? Again, 40 authors, 1,500 years, three languages, uh, and then so many different literary styles. However, none of that should take away from the fact that the Bible ultimately maintains an incredible amount of unity, that it is still an incredibly unified book despite its diversity, And so here is uh, a big idea that I think is really foundational for us to understand as we approach Scripture, and that is that the Bible is one unified story that leads to Jesus. The Bible is one, it contains one unified story that leads to and points to Jesus. And this is something that Jesus himself attested to. You don't just have to take my word for it. In talking to the Jewish religious leaders in John 5, Verses 39 to 40, this is what Jesus said to them. He said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. 
Jesus is saying to them, hey, you're moving in the right direction. You're starting in the right place. You're diligently seeking uh, and studying the scriptures, but you're missing the whole point. You're missing the fact that this is a unified story and it all points to me, and you're missing me as the central theme, the central point that scripture uh, looks toward. And then uh, additionally, in Luke 24, the final chapter of Luke, Jesus has two conversations, first with these two men on the road to Emmaus, and then also he has a conversation with his disciples. And here's what he says in verse 27. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, essentially speaking to our Old Testament today, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then in verse 44, Jesus said to them, uh, now this is his disciples, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses the prophets, and the Psalms. He's speaking to the three key sections that make up the Hebrew scripture or what we would call the Old Testament. And Jesus says, in all of it, it's pointing to me. It's speaking of me. It's prophesying of me. And I've come to fulfill everything that that scripture was speaking of. So tying all of scripture together is a meta-narrative, an overarching storyline with a central theme of God redeeming sinners back to himself through the person and the work of Jesus. And so simply in the interest of time, what I want to do is here is I'm going to read uh, a quote from Richard Schultz as he just kind of summarizes the whole concept here of redemptive context. And so let's let's, uh, listen to this quote together. He says this, The Bible not only contains hundreds of individual stories of people carrying out or opposing God's purposes in this world, But it also offers one extensive story which stretches from the creation to the consummation of human history as we know it, climaxing in the creation of a new heavens and new earth. The story is presented as a drama consisting of several acts with believers today participating in the last scene before the opening of the final act. Over the course of this lengthy history, God has progressively revealed himself and his plan to his people and further developed his way of relating to them. Foundational to this plan and relationship are the various covenants that God has made with Israel and the church. As a result, it is important to determine at what point in this grand story a particular text is located. Otherwise, we may be inclined to misread an earlier text by interpreting it in light of later developments." You know, Pastor Bill, last week, he gave us this really helpful, kind of simple outline that we can look at the grand story as creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. We read about creation in Genesis 1 and 2. We see the fall taking place in Genesis 3. We see the aftermath that basically follows uh, in the next eight or so chapters of Genesis. And then we see God making this covenant promise, covenant relationship with the people of Israel, promising that one day he's going to make things right. Then a Messiah is going to be sent, an anointed one, a Savior is going to come that's going to bring redemption. And then we read in the New Testament in the Gospels how Jesus came to be that redemption, be that Savior, be that Messiah, be that anointed one, the one that came to rescue us. And now we look forward one day when God fully restores and we experience the full restoration, God bringing us back to the perfection that existed there in the garden in the very beginning. That's what we have to look forward to. And so it is a big book. The Bible is a big book, and it is a big story, but the truth is that the message is very simple. The message really is simple enough that a child can grasp it, that a child can understand it. And the message is this, is that God loves you very, very, very much. He created you on purpose, for purpose, that God desires to have a relationship with you, but our sin, your sin, the wickedness and evil within me and within you has separated us from a loving, perfect God. But he loved us too much to leave us separated from him, and that's why he sent his son, Jesus. Jesus, the perfect son of God, came to this earth to live the perfect life that you could never live, and he died a painful, sacrificial death in your place so that you could be offered forgiveness, grace, mercy, and the promise of eternal life with God. Because he is the son of God, because God's power was alive within him, Jesus did not stay dead, but he rose from that grave three days later, demonstrating that he has power to defeat Satan, death, in our sin. And now today, to every one of us, what's offered is the gift of salvation, the gift of grace, the gift of God's mercy. But it is a gift, and I say this pretty much every time I have the opportunity to preach, it is a gift that we have to respond to. It is an offer that we have to receive. And the way we receive it is in faith, that we confess that Jesus is Lord, and we believe that God raised him from the dead. And scripture tells us that if we do that, we will be saved. That is the message. 
It's a big book, it's a big story, but the message is simple, is that God loves you and he's reaching out to rescue each and every one of us. Before I close today, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite the band to, to come to head up to the stage. And as, as they do, we're going to finish by getting very practical here. And up on the screen, what I want to do, uh, you might this morning be wondering, great, that's some really, sounds like some important things that I need to learn about. How do I learn about those things? Uh, you know, you've kind of set me in a direction, but now I don't know necessarily where to go. So what I want to do is I want to just highlight a number of resources that I would really recommend to you to keep in your back pocket to use as resources to learn more about these four layers of context. Uh, so we're going to get really practical here. The first thing I'd recommend is get a study Bible. Uh, a study Bible really hits so many of the things that we talked about today that you're going to get an introduction before every book that really explains who the author is, when it was written, and why you know, that book of the Bible was written. Beneath you know, every passage that you read, you're going to see commentary that really helps you explain some confusing passages. And there's just so many more resources that are packed into a study Bible. So that's a fantastic place to start. I would also encourage you to read multiple translations. Every translation of the Bible, whether we realize it or not, is in and of itself somewhat of an interpretation of the Bible. There is no one-to-one -one direct translation between the Greek or the Hebrew to the English language because there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one word. And so uh, the interpreter or the translators had to go through this process of interpretation to come up with the translations that they did. And so I encourage you to read multiple translations. Uh, next, I would recommend uh, looking into commentaries. There is no secret passcode that you have to give uh, you know, to prove that you're a pastor to read a commentary. Anyone, anyone can read a commentary. And two series that I would recommend, one is called Christ-Centered Exposition, and another is called the Expositor's Bible Commentary. Those are just two that I would recommend for you. And uh, the next thing that I would throw out is Bible backgrounds. These are really a form of commentaries. But this really dives into the cultural differences uh, of the ancient world and how it's very different than our world. These can be really helpful as well. A few more resources. One is BibleGateway.com. I'm not sponsored by BibleGateway.com. Uh, but as I went through seminary, we were trained on this software called Logos. Really robust, really expensive, can do a lot of incredible things. But as I've gotten into practical ministry, I've found that so much of what this really impressive software Logos can do I can accomplish through BibleGateway.com. Uh, it does have a paid version that's about $4 a month, and you can do a lot of incredible things. You can have access to thousands of dollars of commentaries that are linked to any passage that you're looking at at the time. And something I love is you can toggle on or off to see the Hebrew or Greek directly underneath any passage that you are reading. So I encourage you, it has a free trial. Try it for a month. Uh, and if you don't like it after a month, I'll pay you back $4. And just... Everybody don't do that because then I could be out of a lot of money. Um, two more resources. One is Bible Project. This is a nonprofit organization, and really their mantra is to help people see the Bible as one unified story that all leads to Jesus. They have incredible illustrated videos for every single book of the Bible to give you an overview. So anytime you're about to start a book of the Bible, I encourage you to watch that video. It's five to ten minutes long for each book of the Bible to really help you get an overview of what you're going to see, the, the main themes and the movements of that book of the Bible. Additionally, they have a series, 19 videos, called How to Read the Bible. And a few semesters ago, I took a small group through this study called How to Read the Bible. If you look that up on YouTube, you'll find 19 videos. They're five minutes long each. It really dives into genre, literary styles, uh, so much of what we talked about today. And then here are a few books. Uh, one that I really relied on for this message this morning is called Out of Context by Schultz. How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth is one of the most highly recommended uh, books on this topic. And then Asking the Right Questions by Matthew Harmon. Uh, we're going to close, and why don't I go ahead, can I invite you to stand? Uh, we're going to maybe stand for the reading of God's Word. I want to close by just reading one passage. Psalms, which is the song book of our faith, 150 chapters, it opens up the first chapter with these three verses that I'm going to read right now. And it says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. 
You know, as I said before, God's word is a gift to us. It is a gift that he's given us to know how to live the blessed life, how to live our life in a way that honors him and that is the most fruitful life that we can possibly live. And so I want us, my prayer, Pastor Bill's prayer for this church is that we are people of the word, that we are saturated in God's word, that we meditate on his word, that we love his word. And when we do, it will transform our life.